to a live episode of Surviving the Survivor. We bring you the best guests in all of true crime. Don't forget to subscribe and smash that like button. Here's your host, Emmy Award-winning broadcaster, Joel Walton. What's up, SGS Nation, and welcome to another episode of Surviving the Survivor, the podcast that promises to bring you the very best guests in all of true crime, even if sometimes, like yesterday and today, those best guests are a little late. At least we've got one uh, ready and ready to go, uh, and that, of course, is Doug McGregor, who I'm going to introduce in a moment. Uh, Biggie here with, uh, if I can get to it, like this comment, who do you guys think is going to find the real killer now that OJ died? Of course, a historic day of sorts. OJ Simpson passing away today. Almost hard to believe. 76 years old. At one time, he was one of the most likable guys on planet Earth. The guy was a famous football player, uh, number 32 for the Buffalo Bills. Uh, was doing all kinds of uh, Hertz commercials. Or was it Avis? I think it was Avis. I can't remember. And uh, was it Hertz? Was it, it was Hertz? It was Hertz. I don't know. Avis. My dad always used to quote Avis because they said try harder. My dad always say, "Hey, try harder." Um, but either way, you get the idea. He was doing Monday Night Football, and then came uh, Ron Goldman and Nicole Simpson, Nicole Brown Simpson, and uh, he will forever be known as a man that got away with murder. Um, that is a case with overwhelming evidence. Um, and that will be his legacy. And uh, Elena Garcia says it the way I guess I would say it. But I can't say it because I'm hosting the show. But um, what a way to go out. Um, still, obviously, uh, believing that he was uh, somehow innocent of this. I think he believed that in his own mind in some twisted, crazy way. And uh, Fred Goldman today, who I once met and is a great guy, uh, said he's thinking about his son, Ron Goldman, today. He's not thinking about OJ. And uh, there you go. Um, you don't have to say that, but uh, you don't want to step on the dead either. But like I said, uh, when I was a kid, I lived in upstate New York. I had his football helmet. I used to draw on it. I remember that. I don't know why, with a marker. And uh, looked up to that guy till these crimes. And then I looked down and uh, realized what a horrible person some people who you look up to can really be. Um, and there you go with OJ. And again, that will be his legacy, a murderer who got away with it. Um, enough of that. So, uh, the Sumner County Sheriff's office and the Tennessee Bureau of investigation are continuing to search for Sebastian Rogers. This is a horrific case. And, um, we are in the sixth week here. I believe it is 46 days in stat Seth Rogers, of course, desperate to find him. Uh, the mother, Katie Proudfoot, and the stepfather, Chris Proudfoot, have come under extreme scrutiny. We're going to talk about some of that. Uh, of course, you know the man on the screen right now. He is Douglas McGregor, Doug McGregor, better known as the Geo Profiler. By the way, going to be in Toronto on May 21st, and I was talking to Doug. Who wants to see Doug come down to Toronto? It is a four-hour drive, but, man, I would love to have him there. So let us know, uh, not to peer pressure him here, but uh, let's see Let's see what the response is to that. So uh, he is a forensic behavioral analyst and a consultant specializing in geographic profiling and linkage analysis for violent crime and missing persons. Uh, he's got his master's in all that, so he is the real deal. He lives in Ottawa, Canada. Also scheduled to join us, and this is interesting, Heather Cohen, she is the host of Justice Warriors podcast. She was featured on Discovery ID show called Secrets, Lies, and Private Eyes. She used to be the Tennessee State Coordinator for the Q Center for Missing Persons. And believe it or not, I think she's actually out looking for Sebastian as we speak and said she might be a little bit late. So uh, we should see Heather in a little in a little while. Same deal with Courtney Lasky, who is a board-certified behavior analyst for 10 years. Uh, she's been in the field of behavior analysis for 15 years. Uh, she is currently the chief clinical officer for a company called Little Stars, and she's finishing her PhD program uh, right now in behavior analysis, and she's uh, an expert of sorts on autism. So uh, two of the three best guests uh, should be joining us any moment, but uh, without further ado, it has been 46 days. Uh, Doug, 
um, time is the enemy here. After 46 days, uh, I'm sure you've been in this position before. What can you do at this point to try to stay optimistic, even though the odds are certainly against us? Uh, yeah, after 46 days, um, you know, statistically, we're we're moving away from uh, a runaway. Uh, I only it's roughly nine percent of uh, of children with autism are found after that uh, one month mark. Uh, the law enforcement is going to continue their investigation. You know, they're not going to let up, uh, especially being a child. Uh, they they are doing a lot behind the scenes. You know, they are hopefully running concurrent investigations right now, not just for the runaway scenario, but also for scenarios of foul play, um, abduction. And now I say hopefully because I have seen cases where they do not. And I've been involved in those cases uh, unofficially. Um, one example was last year, I was contacted by a member of law enforcement who was part of a high profile investigation. And the and law enforcement in that case was focused on one specific scenario of a woman who went missing. And this person, this law enforcement agent contacted me unofficially and asked if there was foul play involved here, what might it look like? Or how would you look at it? So um, in saying that, I hope that Sumner County Sheriff's Office and TBI are running concurrent investigations here, especially after 46 days. Uh, we welcome in now Heather Cohen. I introed you, uh, Heather, so everyone knows who you are. Uh, were you actually out searching today for Sebastian? Have you been actively searching for him? No, I actually have not. Um, I had some people reach out and ask me to get involved, but I don't like to do that until I've been invited by either law enforcement or a family member. And and just tell us a little bit about your back. I read your bio, so people know you have your uh, podcast, and we'll we'll of course uh, plug that again for you. But tell us a little bit about yourself. How did you get into this line of work, and what do you do exactly? Okay, well, I actually got involved with PI work um, because I started volunteering in missing person cases. Um, I was the Tennessee State Coordinator for the Q Center for Missing Persons. And um, I had gotten involved in a few different cases uh, along the way, Holly Bobo being the first one, the first really big one, um, hit the ground running with that and, and uh, you know, jumped all the way in, dove in, uh, you know, from beginning to end. It, I think it was four or five years that I invested in that case. Um And uh, Devin Bond was another one. I think I mentioned to you that this case reminds me a lot of Devin Bond. Um, I, and I hate to say that it breaks my heart um, because I don't know if you guys know the outcome of the Devin Bond case. No, tell us, uh, give us like a uh, headline uh, encapsulated uh, Devin Bond story. Well, um, Devin was, I believe 16 at the time. And, uh, it was the Murfreesboro area that he disappeared from not too far from, you know, where Sebastian Rogers has gone missing from as well. Um, and it was the same sort of scenario left in the night, um, so on and so forth. And, and, um, you know, we were searching in the woods for him and, and all that. And just so similar. Um, they, they found him a couple of years later and he had committed suicide in the woods. So uh, I, I wonder, you know, I just wonder um, a lot. I have a lot of questions about this case um, that I really haven't seen them address too much. Like, was he being bullied at school? Yeah. Uh, you yeah. know, what I saw the, I saw, yeah, I saw those questions. I actually want to go through them with you. Um, was he found by a hunter? Do you know how Devin was found? Was I really don't walk? remember who actually found him. Um, okay. You know, like I said, it was, it was quite a while after it was, a good year and a half, two years later before they found him. Okay. Um, 
for the geo profiler, Doug McGregor from Joan here. This is a question directed at you. And please shoot direction uh, questions directly at the guests and I'll pull them up. Uh, the grandparents on Chris's side, they drove to Alaska with, within two days of Sebastian going missing. Can Doug tell us how you could go about checking their travel or stops made along the way? The obvious intimation here is that maybe they carried, and I hate to say this, the body of Sebastian and maybe dropped it off. These kinds of questions were actually asked about Brian Koberger, which, by the way, we're covering tomorrow with Scott Phil. There's a lot of movement in that case. But uh, these questions were asked of Brian Koberger in regards to the murder weapon when he drove from Washington State back to his home in Pennsylvania. But, Doug, the floor is yours uh, for this question. Before you answer, though, Shari's News says it would be great to see Doug in Toronto. You guys could do a mini podcast with Doug with a live audience. We sure could, but no pressure, Doug. Go ahead. The TBI and law enforcement in general, they've been they've been tracking um, digital. They've been analyzing digital evidence and tracking the phone activity of, I'll say, persons of interest since the beginning. Um, persons of interest, we can you know imagine who that might include. Um, and then there's probably additional ones that law enforcement knows of as well. Uh, and we know this because the the press release that the TBI put out on March 15th already said that they were already doing that. The other reason I know that they're tracking phones is because of where the search started. So the search, the ground zero for the search has been uh, 1008 Stafford Court, their home address. Uh, mm -hmm. That's not the place last seen other than his mother. Okay, so assuming his mother is a person of interest, you're not going to start you're not necessarily going to start the search there uh, unless you have evidence that he was there. So the place last seen, and I'll, where I'm going with this is the place last seen from public information that I could find is that law enforcement saw Sebastian entering his vehicle after leaving Texas Roadhouse. So that is the place last seen in the public eye other than the mother, right? So in order to place him at his house, they have to track the phone from Texas Roadhouse to his house, directly to there. If there were any stops along the way, that might that might change the last place that he was alive. Um, so in my opinion, that's likely what they did, placing him at his house as the last known position. The place last seen, other than his mother, is still Texas Roadhouse getting into the vehicle. Now, they've likely done the same thing with several persons of interest, which may also include the grandparents. And again, tracking their phones. Uh, vehicles are harder to track. Depends what type of vehicle you have, but vehicles are harder to track. Um, but phones, definitely. And they've tracked those phones um, from their home up to Alaska. You know, if they are persons of interest, they've probably checked with, uh, with Canadian border security um, to see if they picked up anything at the border. Um, but then they're also looking for activity that they've done in Alaska. For example, if they knew, if they went, drove up to Alaska and they went to a hotel, they went to some sightseeing and came back. I'm not, I have no idea what they did. This is just hypothetical. Right. Uh, what they're looking for is abnormal activity. If they drove off into the woods, right? So this is kind of how they identify where bodies may be. And I, I've worked on cases with other geographic profilers that, you know, this is kind of the behavior they're looking for. Did they drive out into some field, into some near a river, right? And then they can identify where a body might be. So they've probably done something like that. And now I'm sure that law enforcement is starting to do or already have done reverse warrants. And this goes back to a question that uh, somebody asked me on X. Uh, and just to so everybody knows what a reverse warrant is, you know, there's, there's, there's three different types. Um, one is location. So it's a geofence warrant, right? So what they can do is they can get a warrant and they can grab everybody, uh, digital activity that was in a certain location. So let's say 300 yards around their residence, and they can find every single phone number that was in that area during that time of his disappearance. And then they can go through them one by one. Um, so they can do that. They're probably already doing that. Uh, and from that, they can identify persons of interest, um, 
Was there any sex offenders in that area? Was there anybody adults that he was talking to online in that area? Um, now they can also do uh, keyword searches. Um, Google's kind of put uh, put some uh, blocks up to this, but they can still do keyword searches and this may change state to state, but if they're allowed to in Tennessee, they can do a keyword search. You know, did, did a stranger adult type in their home address within an hour of him disappearing? They can find that out. Um, if it wasn't in Google, Google's again, has, uh, has, has, you know, disrupted that a little for privacy issues, obviously. Um, but they can find that stuff out. And then the last type of reverse warrant is uh, genealogical. So I'm sure that law enforcement are doing all of these as best they can, as those warrants get approved, as they come in and uh, for all the persons of interest on their list. Wow. That sounds uh, very interesting, but also incredibly time consuming as well. Mm -hmm. This is uh, the young man, young boy that uh, everyone is looking for here. Sebastian Rogers, 15 years old. Again, you want to send tips to 1-800-TBI-FIND, 1-800-TBI-FIND. I brought this comment up. We've had him on the show. He is a best guest. Peter Hyatt is also uh, one of the world's best-known statement uh, analysis uh, professionals. And uh, Twisted Sista here is telling us that Peter Hyatt has a theory, amongst others, that Katie Proudfoot, the biological mother, kicks Sebastian out as punishment after an argument and he's been going through all of the texts uh all the, all the written language uh to try to get a take on it from that perspective um heather to you there's a local story today that i was looking at uh the geofence janet says is going to tell a lot in my opinion uh that sounds about right especially if uh, you're doug mcgregor and you're doing the geo profiling but uh there was a question posed in a local paper today um in the tennessee area and it was the following. How does a teen with autism walking from a home barefoot in the middle of the night with a flashlight just disappear? Um, what do you do? You have any theories on what happened here? I mean, this is just such a peculiar case. You know, the mother says that he went to bed that night. She didn't see him, goes to check on him the next morning. And the stepfather's away allegedly during this time. And then she discovers him missing uh, right. the next morning. But I mean, this is yeah, a simple but profound question. Yeah, I think the flashlight thing was kind of ruled out. So, um, you know, that's kind of there's a lot of speculation there. But um, I do feel like, you know, as a mother of a teen um, who is on the spectrum, I don't really feel like that's um, so terribly out of the um realm of possibility uh that he would have roamed off um you know I, I mentioned to you in the email that one of the reasons i had not taken on this case or even really tried to um volunteer myself at this point was because it was so close to home that it's difficult for me to separate um you know my own personal experiences and you know Sometimes that can be a good thing. Sometimes that can be a bad thing. But um, I feel like, you know, if, and I'll go back to this, if Sebastian was dealing with being bullied at school, if, um, you know, again, um, De and I see a comment from Deborah, that's another thing I was thinking about too, um, that, you know, then there's the factor of, potentially being molested and potentially being abused and bullied at home as well. That's a lot of, that's a lot for an autistic child. It's a lot for any child, but I feel like if there were all these factors and things going on, um, and then there's also bring in, um, who did he have, what platforms did he have access to? You know, if he had a VR, he could have been having conversations with people that, we really don't even know um, conversations that maybe potentially there wouldn't even be any record of um, as a mother of a teen who is on the spectrum. I know that he is very awkward in public, but is incredibly social sociable and able to connect online. So he may have made connections with people online and nefarious people. So there is that as well. 
Um, those are the two theories I'm running with right now, uh, just because with the lack of information, I don't want to speculate that um, I tend to go kind of against the grain anyway, but I don't want to speculate that the parents had anything to do with that. Um, for me at this point, it's just not fathomable. And it looks like uh, Courtney dropped out. Um, I think she's on a phone. She's got here. She is. She's coming back. I can see her here. Uh, I'm going to give her a split second to come back on. There she is. Um, you hearing us okay, Courtney? I am. I'm so sorry. It has been a crazy weather day here. So <laughs> our power is out. We're trying. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no worries at all. Um, I was just going to pick up where Heather left off, which was there are reports out there now uh, that he was being bullied at home, uh, I guess, which is another word for abused, uh, if you want to look at it that way. There are even photos of him now driving a tractor um, around uh, property. So I'm just curious, you know, you're the expert here really on autism and uh, Heather has a child uh, who she says is uh, on the autism spectrum. But um, Courtney, to you, if in fact these reports are true, uh, we have not completely verified this, but if he is being bullied at home, what does that do to a young child uh, who's on the spectrum? It does a lot to any child, whether they're neurodiverse or neurotypical, but especially when a child is autistic, they have some degree of deficit in social skills. Um, their interpretation of the situation and what is acceptable and unacceptable, that's really, really hard. Um, communication, if they're unable to fully express themselves clearly and to a level that um, gosh, like his parents would understand. There could have been so much misunderstanding involved in it. Um, so any kind of bullying, teasing, harassment in that in that sense, it can do a lot to um, development and just confusion in in that child. Uh, Courtney is only here for a short time, so I'm going to bounce back to her. Uh, William Eyelash, I think he's being facetious and or sarcastic. Why is everyone? Why is everyone on the spectrum? Um, it does. It does seem, Courtney, uh, on a serious note, that you hear about it much more. Was it just underdiagnosed in the past, and now more and more people are diagnosed as it, you know, science is advanced and medicine is advanced. Absolutely. It's exactly that. A lot of times, um, previously in medical history, people who who didn't fit what was normal were hidden away from society. You didn't see them as much. So it's part partially now we have acceptance and awareness. It is Autism Acceptance Month. Um, so we have that. We have better capabilities in diagnosing. And then we also understand that autism is a spectrum. You have varying degrees of deficits and strengths. Um, and so people are able to fall in all sorts of, of different ways. So yes, we do see a lot more of it now, but it's it's for a combination of reasons. Uh, understood. Mo Dean is America's favorite troll, and uh, he trolls us, but we love it. I'm constantly bullied in chat, he says. All the ladies give me a group hug. Uh, so uh, <laughs> America's favorite troll is, in fact, here. Um, Geo Profiler, Doug McGregor, back to you. So this is a question that everyone is asking about, which is why uh, are they saying uh, some people are saying foul play? And um, authorities have been very tight lipped, but have sort of murmured that foul play is not ruled out and that no one has been cleared. Mm -hmm. um, and there was another uh, kind of an op ed piece that I was seeing asking this question, which is what would it take to open a criminal investigation here to seek charges? Where, where are we right now? Um, there's really no evidence uh, that is pointing to anything criminal. So I guess they're forced to say, um, you know, there are no there are no suspects. There's no persons of interest. But where do you see us in terms of the investigation, in terms of possibly pinning it on someone who might be responsible for this? I think they're looking, as I mentioned, they're looking into the possibility of foul play and they're looking at all the persons of interest. They haven't ruled anybody out because th I don't think they can yet. Um, you know, let's just hypothetically say, I'm not pointing the finger at anybody, but, you know, either Chris Proudfoot or Seth Rogers, you know, they both have the ability to drive to that house and back in the same night, leave their phone off and make that trip undetected. Um, it's the 
And even if they can say for sure that Chris Proudfoot was still in Memphis, there's nothing to say that he wasn't an accessory to a crime. So uh, I don't think they can rule anybody out at this point. At the same time, they can't, it, they don't seem to have enough hard evidence or circumstantial evidence to say there is foul play. And in order to do that, they're going to need either that evidence or they're going to need a body. Uh, so right now it's an open investigation. They're pursuing different leads. They're looking in different avenues of investigation. And I think it's going to, it's going to stay that way uh, until they have something to come out publicly with. Um, I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. Pass yeah. it on to the others, but yeah, well, I'm actually going to come back to you because this question is directed right at you, but I want Heather's take on this as well. Right after from Jody Arrington, um, Doug, at this point and all the time that has gone by 46 days, uh, what would be the plan of action at this point? What would you be doing? I can tell you what my plan of action would be. I've never been law enforcement. Uh, so my plan of action at this point would be if I were to be brought into this case, which I have not worked this case in any official capacity whatsoever uh, or unofficial. But if I were to be brought into this case, I would be doing my complete geographic profile on the entire situation. Um, I'm looking at the incident. I'm looking at the persons of interest and I'm looking at investigative efforts. Those are the three things I'm looking at. Uh, I don't care what's been done in terms of the search. If I was brought in, um, it, it's too much effort for me to create my profile, create my search strategy and also take into account what they've done and try to let it just take too long. I give them what, what, what I come up with. And then from that, they can use what they like. Uh, so that's what I would do in terms of the search strategy. Uh, and that, that would include, it would not include uh, search and rescue techniques um, and operational procedures because I'm not search and rescue. Uh, but it would include different strategies, strategies, different avenues uh, to look into. Um, and then I would also look into every single person of interest uh, that I know about and that if I was working with law enforcement, the names that they would give me, uh, big intel background checks on all of them. Uh, and then the incident itself, I'd be looking into the incident and everything surrounding the incident. You know, are there any potential crime scenes, uh, last place, last known position, last place scene, everything that goes into searching for a missing person. Uh, but that's, that's, that's where I'd begin. That's a lot, but that's where I would begin. And Heather, how about yourself? Where, where would you be uh, directing this investigation at this point if you were in charge? If I was brought in as a private investigator, and as Doug said, I'm not law enforcement, so I can only speak from where I am. Um, I would do a deep dive, kind of like he said, background checks, um, look into everybody. But I wouldn't just look into the persons of interest. I would basically look into everybody and anybody that had access to Sebastian. Um, I would want to find out basically I, I would want to know what his, what he did, like what his life was for a good month leading up to the disappearance, you know, where had he been? Um, what had he done? Um, and just talk to everybody. And I think the biggest thing, and I say this a lot that, and, and I'm not saying that's the case here, but it tends to be the case sometimes that law enforcement will, you know, zone in on a certain um, theory, on a certain person, and um, will sometimes miss things. So I would want to really go back and, and look at everything and see if there's any leads, anything that they're not paying attention to that maybe should have been paid attention to. Um, I, I tend to take the alternate route. Um, so that's that's I think that's what I would be doing right now. Uh, in the chat, Bruce W says, uh, you talking to me, I think in the panel, you offered no example of abuse. Uh, and then you've got keep up the chatter. We know by Chris Proudfoot's own words that he was hit with a belt, uh, most likely more than once. And we also know Sebastian, uh, was sad, I guess. Um, but, um, some people might not find that abusive in my book. That's certainly abusive. I don't do that to my children. I don't think it should be done to any kids. He gets smacked with a belt buckle. Um, Courtney, uh, just wondering since the last time we talked, 
if you've had any more thoughts about this, um, if he was being abused regularly, and that is an if, if he was being abused regularly, how do you think this would play on his psyche uh, considering, um, you know, his, his autism diagnosis? You know, I would be super curious to know who um, outside of his family he had connections with for several reasons, but if he was, had some abuse within the home. Was he talking to anyone about this? Um, my mind goes to, I would hope that he has some sort of outlet, whether it was a friend. We know he played video games. So was he talking in chats on video games? And maybe he could have expressed something that way um, without knowing him specifically and his his communication deficits. I'm not sure if he, if he had that outlet. But um, regardless, being abused in any way in that situation is awful, but he could be internally processing um, escape, avoidance. How do I get away from this scenario? How can I avoid that scenario from happening again? And if he doesn't have a proper outlet or somebody he can communicate with, um, it could be misinterpreted and that could lead to him leaving in the middle of the night. Yeah. Uh, that stormy weather down in Atlanta, I can, I can hear it and feel it. Um, the stepfather, uh, no, it's all good. Uh, from Deborah Hillman, uh, the stepfather was supposedly mocking him for wearing pull-ups. Again, this is a report that came out. Danielle K is, uh, saying no disrespect to the channel. So sick of hearing excuses for these parents that apparently lack. I don't think anyone here has made a single excuse, uh, about these parents. If anything, it's the exact opposite. I'm not sure. Uh, what you're watching. But um, what about this notion that perhaps he was uh, mocking uh, young Sebastian for wearing these pull-ups? Yeah, that's, Courtney, I mean, that's, yes, yeah, sorry. I can hear you just fine. Um, it's just unacceptable on all levels. We want to promote strength and growth in our children. And by mocking them, that's doing nothing to help him improve if they are working on potty training. And it's very normal for kids of all ages to have bedwetting accidents and need nighttime pull-ups, um, especially if you're in an abusive situation. We know that can increase um, bedwetting. So that's not surprising at all. It can make that situation way worse. Um, back to the TBI. Oh, I, this is actually the Sumner County Sheriff. So I apologize. Eric Craddock um, and Heather to you. Uh, he said, we have not cleared anyone, but we have no evidence of foul play. Um, he went on to say that uh, there are theories uh, at play. And um, then uh, District Attorney Ray Whitley in that county, in Sumner County, says that there needs to be something uh, more physical evidence, blood, Sebastian's clothing, a flashlight, security video, or an eyewitness implicating someone. But none of that uh, has been found. Um, if you want to speak to that. And then I just wanted to circle back to Doug's earlier comment, Heather, that uh, Chris was allegedly in Memphis. It's a three hour and 37 minute drive. But mm -hmm. it, there is a possibility he could have, in the darkness of night, gone and come back. Have you pondered that? Have you thought about that? I have. And um, in preparation for the podcast, I did go through and watch several uh, videos, including Nancy Grace. So I'm aware of some of the comments that people have made. And, and I do agree that his statements, there are some some things, some red flags in his statements that are concerning. Um, but uh, as Ray had said, you know, there's there's nothing found. There really is no evidence. So we we really can't jump to that conclusion. Um, and I think that, like, I mean, how many people have been in a situation like this? I'm you know, it's easy for us to sit back and 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 say, oh, well, they said this wrong or they did this wrong. But I mean, how do you really act when your child is missing and when you're under a microscope? Um, so I don't know. You know, his he was he was very specific about the three hours and 37 minutes. And I was just kind of like, hmm, that's weird, you know, that he would be so specific like that, almost as if, you know, it, it was planned out. You know, if that was the case, obviously that that would insinuate that it was a premeditated thing and, you know, plan this trip, yada, yada. Um, and I can see why people would think that. 
But at this point, with there being no evidence about that, um, Doug was talking about the things that could kind of turn it into a criminal investigation. And I, I was thinking in my mind about something else, too, that I'd seen in past cases where um, and I can't remember which one specifically I was thinking of, but the where, you know, they find that. Uh, the parents or, or whoever are misleading law enforcement. So if they could find, you know, if there was something that they, they knew that they had been directly and um, deliberately uh, misled, then they could start looking at it as a criminal and start looking at bringing charges. Hmm. Um, well, yeah. Time is going to tell on that one, you know, they're paralleled in some ways and completely different others, but we've got these two missing mothers in Oklahoma. And in that case, um, there's a lot more um, sort of subtle evidence, if you will, that uh, people are responsible for that crime, but still uh, no action has been taken there. So sometimes it takes a while. Um, I think we're going to see movement in that case much sooner, possibly than this case. Uh, Matthew McMahon is not just anybody. He is, uh, he shares a child with Rachel Morin, and Rachel Morin is his uh, child, Faye, who's 18 years old. Rachel Morin was murdered back on August 6th. Uh, she was discovered August 6th, I believe. It has been way too long. Doug McGregor has personally helped out um, on this case pro bono, and uh, we've got to get Rachel's name back out there. I reached out to Matt today. There was actually a commercial that was put out, and I didn't realize it, but um, Matt and others um, did not um, sign off on it. And it just goes to show you that things can get very complicated in many different ways um, after a tragedy. But the important thing here is to keep Rachel Morin's name out there. And uh, we will circle back with Matt, no doubt. And uh, we'll get Doug back on the show. Uh, we've got to find her killer. Um, there was a DNA match, but no ID because the same suspect was found to have committed a crime in Los Angeles. So uh, we will definitely get back on that. Um, Doug McGregor and, and Matt, I will definitely be in touch with you. Um, so with this notion that they can't really um, conduct a criminal investigation because really nothing has been found, um, this DA went on to say that the simple fact right now is there is nothing. Um, the Sumner County uh, Emergency Management Director came out and said his crews are on call, ready to go whenever uh, whenever investigators with new leads come out on potential evidence. The question here, Doug, is how long can you go um, with nothing? Uh, the fact that they're saying there's literally nothing to go on, how long can you go on that? I think you just keep going until you find something. And, uh, you know, you just, you keep spreading the word about Sebastian. Uh, you keep looking into, uh, you know, different leads, keep the tips coming in. Uh, there's, there's lots of different methods. Uh, you know, I named some of the more technical ones you, uh, that they can use and it won't dry up completely. Different things will come in. We, as the public may not hear about them. Uh, you know, one thing that I do, that I do want to stress and highlight though, is most runaway teenagers come back on their own. That's how most of them come back. Vast majority. All right. And we as a community have probably completely ruined the possibility of that happening. You know, we've been highlighting the trauma in his past. And, you know, some of that the parents brought up and they're welcome to talk about whatever they like. It's their child if they think it can help. But we keep bringing it up in the media. Um, the trauma in his past the thing with the pull-ups and autistic children. I've known a lot of autistic children in my lifetime. Courtney is an expert on this. You know, they have a hard enough time fitting in, making friends. They're likely bullied. And now we expect him to come home and go back to school with everybody knowing this information. That's not going to happen. You know, I've, I've known kids that have moved schools or have contemplated and hurting themselves for far, far less. So mm -hmm. it is so hard now for Sebastian. It could be, I'm not going to speak for him, but it could be very difficult in his mind to assimilate back into his community and not, and have these things go away. That's not going to happen. So we've, that, that is in my opinion, off the table. 
he's not coming back on his own free will. All right. So we have to, the, the investigation has to, you know, find him hopefully alive and hopefully healthy. But if not, they have to continue to pursue leads in other avenues, foul, you know, foul play or whatnot. Yeah. Uh, Courtney, that brings up a, a sad question to ask, but is there any kids w- who are on this autism spectrum, do they have a higher rate of unaliving themselves than a typical child? Yes. Um, I don't know the exact statistic, but yes, they do. Um, and that's exactly contributed to what he was just saying is um, the perspective taking, the understanding, the social skills, the bullying, Um, feeling ostracized, feeling the inability to be your true self and having to, we call it masking, um, covering your symptoms of autism essentially and trying to fit into what's normal. And it's exhausting and it's hard and that's tough on anyone, especially an adolescent. And so that risk is increased tremendously. Mm. Um, I'm going to come back to you in just a moment. I've got a, a couple of, you know what, let me ask you this before I forget it. Cause this is a really important question. I think, you know, I, I I'm so fearful that my own kids who thankfully are very healthy and, and wild kids with big personalities. I'm fearful that one day, you know, they're, they're going to bully someone or say something stupid. So every day when I drop them off, I read them the riot act, be nice to everyone, treat kids all the same, treat the mm-hmm. custodian, like the principal. I go through a whole list of things. What can parents say to their children um, who are not on the autism spectrum to be respectful of those who are, since they are different, they're young, uh, and they might not know how to behave in front of them? Uh, What is your suggestion on that? I love that question. Um, I think that is tremendous as a parent to be able to to preach inclusion and acceptance for my own kids i'm always telling them find the kid who's by themselves at lunch and go sit with them find the kid on the playground who doesn't have anyone to play with invite them to play um, with autistic individuals there's a chance that they want to be included they want to play but they don't know how and so stressing just that simple kindness and the ability to branch out um, look past what everyone else in your group is doing and saying and look for the ones who are alone and might want an opportunity they're not getting uh well said and i'm gonna i'm gonna use that about if they find the kid who's sitting alone i'm going to use i'm learning a lot from uh these people on uh, Surviving the Survivor. So it's coming in handy in my own life here. Uh, Marlena Cantu, question for Heather. Why aren't uh, Katie and Chris Proudfoot, the biological mother and stepfather uh, for Sebastian, why aren't they looking for something or someone um, right now? Why aren't they out there actively doing this? And not only that, they moved away. Uh, your thoughts on this? Uh, well, it is a it is a really good question. Um I mean, I know that as a mother, um, I don't think I would sleep. I think I would be out there looking 24 seven. Um, and you know, I, I don't know, I don't know this woman. I don't know. I don't know anything about her. So I don't know what to make of that really. Um, I don't have a good answer for you. It's definitely a red flag. Um, but you're right. Like, you know, if they don't, they don't believe he's out there somewhere to be found, um, then they're not going to be looking for him. So, uh, you know, maybe they think somebody has him, which I think I've heard them actually say. Um, that's the best I can. That's the best guess I've got for you. I'm, I, I wish well, I was psychic, but I'm just a PI. No, no, no. Sorry. Uh, you can only answer what you can answer. I appreciate it. Uh, yeah. So, Doug. Uh, obviously there's been a lot of community involvement here, people handing out flyers, but they're also conducting their own searches. Um, is that a problem for you? You know, if you're, if you're on scene somewhere, do you want quote unquote, just the professionals handling it? Are you okay with this sort of crowdsourcing community help? The, the help can, can be great. Um, Searches have to be coordinated. They have to be organized properly or they can often hurt the investigation even more. You have, oftentimes it's better to have 10 
good searchers, then a hundred volunteers from the public uh, that aren't coordinated. You and I, I'm not search and rescue. I work with search and rescue, but search and rescue are very good. The, at least the the legit search and rescue um, groups are very good at coordinating searches, probability mapping, uh, having giving individuals assigned tasks, telling them exactly what to look for. You're not just looking for Sebastian. You're looking for Sebastian and everything that he had him had on him when he went missing, for example. Uh, and then these people report back. They have, uh, they're given, um, some of them are given different tasks, whether metal detectors or whatnot. They're told exactly where to look and how to look. But if you just have people going out and searching, you know, to what end, right? I mean, if I come back and say, ah, I searched that farm over there, what does that mean? You know, does that mean I searched everywhere in the hay field, every inch of that barn underneath the, like underneath the floorboards? Like, what does that mean? It means absolutely nothing to the people trying to organize the official searches. So you have the law enforcement that generally do their thing and they will search based on leads. You know, they will search, they will search and rescue law enforcement will do their initial search of the last known position, the place last seen. And then they will conduct searches in other areas based on leads, whether it's from um, digital evidence or whether it's from an eyewitness, whatever it may be. Uh, and then on the, generally speaking, you have the volunteer search, which is completely separate. And you have some people, somebody organizing that. And it's, I've seen volunteer searches that are very organized um and very and and fairly well done i won't say very well done but fairly well done and then i've seen others that are absolute chaos uh the the people mean well they do um for the most part but it's it's when it when it comes down to the law when it comes down to law enforcement and the official search and rescue units giving their reports and analysis Disorganized volunteer searches, in my experience, rarely get factored into that because they don't know what they've done and to what quality. Uh, Nikki Cuds, who has a child on the autism spectrum, my son always wanted to be included. That's all he wanted. So it could be something as simple as that. Um, kind of breaks my heart to hear that. Uh, this is a quote from Seth Rogers, of course. Rogers is a And I was that this, of course, is Sebastian's uh, father, Seth Rogers. You guys are Sebastian's army. We will find him. We will find him alive. We will find him well. Um, let it let us hope that that is, in fact, the case. Um, Heather, back to you. I was going to ask you. It takes a second for this thing to pop back into uh, position. But uh, Doug was talking about, you know, useful searches versus unuseful mm -hmm. searches. But. What makes a good searcher? Are there qualities that make someone a good searcher? Well, first and foremost, I guess, determination. And, and uh, I mean, sometimes, you know, it, it can be really um, strenuous, you know, conditions. It can be really hot. It can, you know, when we searched for Holly Bobo and the Natchez Trace, um, the trees and, and all the brush was so thick that, I mean, you couldn't see, um, somebody could be two feet in front of you. You wouldn't see them. That's how much was in front of you. Um, we had to go through with, you know, the machetes and, and cut all that down just to get through. Um, you come out with ticks. It is, I mean, it is not fun. It is not glamorous. You have to really be dedicated. Um, but like Doug was saying, you know, honestly, having a hundred searchers out there just trampling on what could be a crime scene um, can often do more damage and could actually lose evidence. Um, so you think, you know, the more people, the merrier, and that's not really always the case. Uh, this this is a statement that uh, Katie Pratfoot put out a little while ago. Um, they didn't um, speak initially, then they talked, and then were kind of silent. And here's a, the statement. Um, some of you may have heard this from Katie Pratfoot, Sebastian's biological mother. Unfortunately, with no new legitimate leads, our statement remains the same. 
We are trying to get his face out there to everyone because I think the more people know and search, the better chance we have of finding him. We do appreciate the support from the neighborhood and community. We want to let the community know that we don't have words to express our gratitude for the support we have received in searching for our son. And we pray that everyone continues to help search and pray that we find him and bring him home safe. The pain of our son's absence is beyond words. We ask that everyone everywhere remain aware and continue to look for anything that can help us find Sebastian and bring him home. Uh, the only problem with this statement, Courtney, is they themselves aren't searching. They use the word search a gazillion times in this statement. Um, psychologically speaking, what do you make of that? I I find it really odd. Um, it's hard. It's very hard as a mother, especially for me to predict how I would act. I know that I would be out there until that child was brought home. I would keep searching until there was a reason not to search anymore. Um, for them to not physically be out there searching, I'm not sure even why that could be unless she was told not to get involved. But we see Mr. Rogers, Seth Rogers out there searching physically boots on the ground. So nobody's told him not to. So it's there's a big contrast in my mind. Um, I'm not sure why she wouldn't be involved. Uh, by the way, uh, tomorrow, a uh, special time with Phil and Scott. We do it every Friday. It shows so good. It happens every week. Uh, and that is great. Scott, your true crime. Phil with America's most respected detective, Phil Waters, and the FBI, Scott Duffy. And we're going to be looking at Brian Koberger. A lot going on in that case, 11 a.m. tomorrow. Next week, we're going to stay on this case. We're also going to uh, follow the missing uh, moms who went missing in Oklahoma. I feel like that's going to break very soon. There's going to be some. There's going to be half. And COE and Space Coast, just for your own enjoyment, my audio is starting to get whacked out here a little bit, uh, keeps going off on me. So uh, just a little uh, insight into my own uh, suffering here. Um, one of the things, Doug, that's going on is the, uh, the sheriff is asking, literally asking people in Sumner County, uh, like you just said, like it's one thing to search, but are you looking under floorboards? And he put out this ask to everyone to to really search twice a day your property and to really search it look under the decks look you know un, under uh you know uh around corners under in garages behind walls in your garage um what is the point of this at this juncture that someone will suddenly find something yeah it, it, it's a smart move um for a couple of reasons one we all generally speaking we know our own properties better than anybody else so we know all the little nooks and crannies uh two it cuts through a lot of red tape because uh now you don't have to ask permission to go onto private property so it helps with that uh, it avoids dangerous conflict of people going onto other people's private property that don't want them there so there's a lot of benefits to doing that uh at the same time, there's no, there's no, there's no confirmation that anything has been searched, right? Unless you have every single person reporting back in, back into you that they've searched their property twice a day. So it's just, it's just another measure they're taking. Um, and, but the only feedback they're likely going to get is if somebody finds something useful. Um, but it, it, I think it, I think it is important. Um, you know, Sumner Ca County Sheriff's Office, I'm not sure. I, To my knowledge, they still have the lead on this investigation. I'm not sure how much experience they have with this type of this investigation. They may have a lot, uh, but I am happy to see that they are working alongside uh, alongside the TBI and other other agencies. Yeah. And, and Heather, um, the thing that makes this so incredibly difficult, look at this comment. This child could be stuck in a chimney or in the water that's if you left the house and then you follow that by lindsey shea who's always in the chat and happy to see her here a boy was just rescued from a chimney yesterday down the street from me you never know where he could be this is truly heather like finding a needle mm -hmm. in a haystack i mean you're looking for a 15 year old boy in all of america and that could include alaska for all we know mm -hmm. um, i mean this is like a, a really daunting task you're a pi how do you keep yourself from being defeated? Well, 
I mean, it's definitely difficult cases like this, you know, um, it could be two weeks, two months or two years or um, I hate to say it, but or never. I mean, there are some people that are never found. Um, so it's just we just keep praying and keep hoping and and um, keep doing everything we can and hope that this isn't one of those cases that 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 he is somewhere where he can actually be found. Uh, Courtney Lasky has somewhere to be right at the top of the hour. So I want to be respectful of that. Courtney, uh, just wondering, um, sadly, we had you here. Uh, he wasn't found. We had you back. He's still not found. Hopefully the next time we have you on, he'll be back safe and sound. But uh, just your I final so. thoughts today before you have to uh, take off on us. Yes, this I mean, this case is so heartbreaking with every day that goes by and like he's still not found. There's still no new evidence being revealed. Um, I'm hoping that there's evidence behind the scenes that we're not seeing. I, I really hope that um, so they've got leads somewhere. Um, I'm wishing nothing but the best. But with every day that passes, it's really hard to to understand where he might be and how he got there. Yeah, Courtney, real quick, just percentage wise to put you on the spot, uh, make you a little <laughs> uncomfortable. I was telling my kids. Uh, make yourself uncomfortable every day because life's not easy. Um, didn't go over very well when I forced my daughter to play soccer and she didn't want to do that. But um, man, you really, one day you just, I turned into my dad. You turn into your dad one day, but uh, it's just so hard to believe that he left that house on his own uh, at this mm -hmm. point. Percentage wise, um, where would you put it uh, that he did leave his house on his own? Under 50%, under 30%, above 70%, uh, what what do you think? You know, I've never been good at math, but I would say uh, <laughs> less than less than fifty percent chance that he left on his own. Just knowing his history um, of not leaving without shoes, his shoes are at the house. Um, never having a history of leaving in the middle of the night, and yet he did. So those are big behaviors and big patterns to break. It had to have been for a reason. All right. Uh, Courtney, thank you so much. Have a great night. Thank and you, so uh, you, you gave thank me you. some good adv good advice to share today uh, with my kids. So we'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye. Uh, Doug, one of the things they're talking about, I think you sort of touched on this when you were talking about the Alaska uh, stuff, but um, the Sumner County Sheriff and TBI say that they do have a sophisticated mapping system. What does that mean in lay terms? It, it means they have they do have intelligence officers, uh, agents that are very good in geospatial analysis. They are very good at at retrieving that digital evidence, that phone, those phone, anything from phones to watches, air earbuds. I mean, you, you name it, anything they can give location data. Um, they may bring in the FBI um, with their with their cellular 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 analysis unit, um, and th they can map out a lot of different things. Um, they can do geofencing, uh, keyword searches, internet searches, you name it. They can map it. Uh, so they probably have different agents uh, working on those types of things. Uh, Doug, one of the things I wanted to ask you because you mentioned this about driving potentially, uh, you can't rule the father out, even though he was in Memphis, but. When he spoke to Nancy Grace and we played this on the last show, something just stuck out at me. And that was he was so precise about the time. He says, uh, I was in Memphis and it's three hours and 37 minutes uh, door to door. I think I asked Phil Waters, a detective about this. Um, that is just a very specific amount of time, almost like he's creating an alibi. Um, I don't want to throw this guy under the bus, but. I guess the bigger question here is there is a possibility in your mind that the drive could have been made uh, through the dark of night. Um, it's three hours, 37 minutes. He could have potentially driven from Memphis, done something and gotten back to Memphis by the morning. Right. There is always the possibility. Um, now I just say that based on what I know as a member of the public, uh, when it, you know, I always try to look at both sides. I always try to remain completely objective. And and that goes back to, you know, when I was coming on this show today, somebody mentioned to me, I, I don't think it was a, a warning, but they just said, you know, that I better read up on the case first. 
By the way, I think I said dad. <laughs> I, I meant to say no. stepfather, and that's exactly what I meant. Thank you for the correction if I said father. Stepfather, Chris Brown. Go ahead. Doug. Right. So I always try to remain objective and filter out all the all the all the opinions and the misinformation. Um, you know, when I look at somebody that says an exact time like that, it may mean something, it may not. And it's tough to jump to those conclusions. It goes back to what Heather said. Everybody acts differently. You know, I I know an I know a a guy, you know, a, a friend of mine, and every single time he drives anywhere, even if he's been there a dozen times, he puts it into GPS. He always knows the exact amount of time it takes to get there. So it's it's not it's a little odd that he's being specific. It can be seen that way. I understand that, but it's not necessarily a sign of guilt. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, you don't, you know, especially if there's no responsibility on their end, you don't want to do this, but I think a lot of people are questioning it. That is always the elephant in the room, in the room. but. Got to follow the evidence. Why I'm getting muted by myself, I don't know. Um, hang on a second, everyone. COE was in here, but uh, still having some technical issues. Uh, this is from Susan Nyland, the TBI spokeswoman. Even though there's not that high visibility uh, in investigating uh, this case, we are not done. Uh, this has gone back to what could be considered Good old fashioned police work, interviewing individuals, re-interviewing individuals, checking out leads, et cetera, et cetera. So they are leaving uh, the proverbial uh, no stone unturned. La Mesa here. Do we know? Uh, this is a great question, I think. Uh, Heather, I'm going to throw this one to you. If a law enforcement um, has contacts of all of Sebastian's online and gamer buddies, I guess assuming that he was into that, kids share so much more than we realize through those forums. They feel uh safe sharing in that manner it is a totally new world i mean when i grew up i was playing pong on atari and coleco vision if you guys remember that under my blankets with uh little stick figures for nfl football players i used to keep records and all that I had all the visions the whole thing but um what about this new world heather where gamer who was playing video games he could have been talking to people I and mean, we've seen people run away just to meet fellow gamers right yeah, that's kind of what I was saying about um, about my son, how awkward he is in real life social situations. But um, being, you know, on the spectrum, he does actually connect with a lot of people online and they're all his BFFs. Um, you know, uh, it, it, it's crazy. I mean, there are people that he's been associated with online for years that he's never actually met in person and he does talk about going to visit them sometimes um so i do think that is a possibility you know it could have been a situation where in real life sebastian did not feel like he fit in he did not feel like he belonged at home he did not feel like he belonged at school um or you know but there could have been somebody online that made him feel very um accepted and that could have been a motivation for him to leave. Hmm. Uh, Star Jerk is telling us that Sebastian did not have access to online gaming. Maybe he sneaked it in there. I don't know. Um, someone once told me the word snuck is not a word. So I always say sneaked. And uh, I'm not sure if that's true or not, but uh, I've always gone by that um, by that advice. So uh, Doug McGregor, a couple more things, and then we will slowly wrap this up. But uh, the Secret Service and apparently the FBI have also been brought in. Um, what what do they do differently? Those two agencies, obviously, we're used to the Secret Service protecting the president. But uh, what do they, what do they do in these circumstances? In these cases, the FBI and the Secret Service. I'm not I'm not completely sure why they have been brought in. I mean, I can I can hypothesize. So the FBI gets brought in for one, their abilities, right? They have better technical abilities in a lot of areas. Um, they have behavioral analysis units, specialized units like behavioral analysis. And they also get brought in if anything goes cross cross border from one state to another, right? They have that, uh, they have that jurisdiction as well. So 
they may have been brought in for any any one of these. Um, the Secret Service, I'm I'm not completely sure what they were brought in for. I assume it was it's it's similar in nature, either technical or expertise in some area, um, and and that's probably why they were brought in as well. But I'm not completely sure on that answer. Mm. Uh, brutally honest here. Sebastian did leave, and this is for Heather, and this is your own experience as a mother of mm -hmm. uh, a child with uh, on the autism spectrum. Um, if he did leave the home on his own accord, then he would have done so because he was truly scared to stay in the house and thought it would be best to hide somewhere outside. Do you agree with that? I mean, it's anything's a possibility. I, I, I'm not going to say, no, that's wrong. That's, you know, no way. Um, sure, it's possible, but I just, I don't see him leaving unless he had somewhere to go. Um, especially being an autistic child who seems to have been pretty sheltered from the outside world. Um, he, I don't think he would feel any more comfortable or safe leaving the house. I mean, it's big and it's scary out there, especially for somebody who's neurodivergent. Um, so no, I, I just I just don't feel that. Um, but I did want to kind of expand on the FBI thing. Um, that could also indicate that there's something that's gone on online. Because think about the fact that you know jurisdictional, um, you know, like Tennessee or Sumner County wouldn't have jurisdiction over something that happened on a platform that's based out of California. Um, that's just an example, but, you know, so that would be a reason to bring in the FBI or the secret service. Never gotten such a passionate feedback. A million people telling me that snuck is a word. I think we're <laughs> going to have to start the, uh, the word of the show. Um, the best word of, uh, the broadcast, uh, we'll have to start that. We'll, we'll pull up a word. My dad used to make me read Herman Melville and, Nathaniel Hawthorne, when I was in like in seventh grade, um, used to force me to sit down and read. So uh, I, I used to read back then, learned a couple of big uh, words, and uh, that's about it. That's that's pretty much all I learned. And then I forgot most of them. Um, Doug McGregor, this is a little out of your purview, but I'm just curious to get your take. Um, Amber Alerts, uh, they are typically resolved within hours. Uh, right now, however, According to the NCMEC, better known as the National Center for Missing and, and Exploited Children, uh, they collaborate with the U.S. Uh, Justice Department on this. Um, there are only two um, current active AMBER alerts nationally, uh, from what I understand. Uh, the other one is a three-year-old boy named Elijah View. I have to be honest, I don't know much about. He has been missing since February uh, in Wisconsin. So he's the other. And then Sebastian Rogers is the one that we uh, all know of because we're here talking about him. Uh, one of only two active Amber Alerts. Uh, what does that mean? Your your like, guess is as good as mine, Joel. <laughs> uh, I, I was following that on X today and, and it was going back and forth, whether it's a thing or not a thing. And, yeah. uh, and there was one true crime personality that commented that it was a thing and she's formerly FBI, but then the TBI spokesperson came out, commented on hers, uh, replied to her and said that it is not a thing. So I, I have no idea if a national Amber alert is a thing in the United States or not. And, uh, and if it is why there would only be two children on there. Um, it's kind of, like you said, it's out of my, uh, out of my jurisdiction. Yeah, it's it, it struck me as kind of weird. And I did see that uh, argument. I think that it was um, an issue of semantics. I think it was that there are two active ones nationally. Someone called them national Amber Alerts. And that's how that argument. Sorry, but that's what Twitter is for. Totally pointless arguments and everyone gets worked up. Um, so, Heather, uh, and for some reason, my mic keep or my headphones keep cutting out and I keep getting muted. But um, in the little bit of time we have left, these were some of the questions that you had for yourself and others. Uh, was Sebastian being bullied at school? Which online platforms and games did Sebastian have access to? We're hearing he didn't have access to much. Had Sebastian ever shown signs of depression or tendencies to maybe want to unalive himself? Were there weapons in the home? And are any of those weapons missing? 
Are these typical questions that you ask yourself? Or are you only asking yourself these in this particular circumstance? Um, I think they're pretty typical questions for um, missing people, you know, Sebastian's age. Um, but it's also tailored specifically to what I know about this case. Uh, there you go. Um, so listen, Sebastian, it has been 46 days and uh, we're doing these shows to get the word out there, uh, to, to bring up his photo like this one, to let people know uh, that people do care about him and that we are looking for him. And uh, another amazing panel today. Big shout out um, to Courtney Lasky. She's a board certified uh, behavior, anal uh, behavior analyst for the last 10 years. She's been in the field for 10 She's now getting her PhD, so uh, she is the real deal, knows a lot about the autism spectrum. And then a first-time best guest, a private investigator that we're going to have back on is Heather Cohen. She is the host of Justice Warriors podcast. That is Justice Warriors podcast, and uh, she's also been featured on Discovery ID show Secrets, Lies, and Private Eyes. Secrets, Lies, and Private Eyes. She used to be the Tennessee State Coordinator for the Q Center for Missing Persons. Heather, I'm curious, how did you get into this line of work? Um, well, <laughs> uh, I used to be a paralegal. Um, that's how it kind of started. And then when my mother uh, was killed in a car accident in 2008, um, I think it was kind of a coping thing for me to shut down emotionally and go at it from a I, I basically started investigating and I went out and knocked on doors and got statements and took measurements and built a case against the guy that hit my mother head on um, and took it to sorry, court. I'm sorry to hear that, by the way. Well, thank you. Um, but just kind of between that and then getting involved with the missing persons cases, it just kind of this is it unraveled and this is where it landed me. I, I realized that I have um, a knack for uh gathering information and um and people tell me things that they don't tell uh law enforcement so i have a way of extracting that um yeah, yeah. that's that's super important our detective phil waters tomorrow uh, one of the best in the world he teaches classes around the world on obtaining criminal confessions he has a way of uh speaking to people he scared the crap out of me last week when he started to uh question me uh, on the show <laughs> uh c star here I'm finally justified. Sneaked is correct, but snuck, yes, is common and considered an irregular verb. I guess it is still a word, but um, I was told, according to, I guess, the AP style book when I was a journalist, that uh, you don't say he snuck out of the house. He sneaked out of the house. This is why journalists drive me crazy, too. They they also obsess over uh, minutia and crazy little things. But the COE knows what I'm talking about. We would have news directors that would get on our case about you could never in a, a newsroom say uh, a, a mother's worst nightmare because that's a cliche you get yelled at laughed at um, all these sorts of things so I think I've been uh, conditioned uh, to look at words a little bit differently Doug McGregor this man looks at uh, geography differently he is better known as the geo profiler friend of the show a best guest uh, he's a forensic behavioral analyst and a consultant specializing in geographic profiling. And uh, Doug, when are you starting your own podcast? You don't have one, do you? Uh, no, I do not. I do have a YouTube channel with the same handle, uh, the Geo Profiler, but there's nothing on it yet. So eventually I will get some content on there. It's Doug, something I'm Doug, I'm going to put you on, on under pressure right now. I'm going to talk to you and maybe we'll uh, get you a show cranking on uh, STS where we already have 107,000 subs and we will promote you. So we'll talk about that off air, but uh, it's something I'm I'm uh, toying with. So uh, let, let's discuss that. And by the way, everyone wants you to come to Toronto. So no pressure, but pressure. Uh, your final thoughts today. My final thoughts are as the public, we cannot participate in a foul in a, a a scenario that involves um foul play we can participate in a scenario that involves a missing child uh lost or injured so i do encourage the public to continue um continue searching continue to search their properties continue to get the word out there uh you know keep sebastian's name sebastian's name in the media 
you know, if you're from Nashville, check the homeless population in Nashville. I've known a few teenagers, 14, 15, that they've gone, they've run away from home and they have nowhere to go or nowhere they wanted to go. So they end up with the homeless population. So check that. Nashville is the closest city, uh, large city. You know, check, you know, public transportation routes, right? I'm sure law enforcement is looking into public transportation, buses, trains out of that area. Um, you know, I he went missing on a Monday and I know they leave Monday morning at 3 a.m. is a common time out of that area, out of the Nashville area. Wow. Um, so, he, I mean, he could be anywhere in the country right now. And if you do live in his community and, and you know, I, I don't want to be the one to, to say this, but you know, if you live in the community and you're, you know, yes, look for Sebastian, you know, look for the articles of clothing, glasses, the clothes that he was wearing. Um, but, if you notice, if you notice anything that's not normal, you know, animal activity, disturbed soil, your dogs pick up on something, uh, you know, it's, it's not nice to think about, but let law enforcement know, you know, a foul smell, let law enforcement know because everybody wants Sebastian home safe and alive, but just getting Sebastian home is also important. So if anything has befallen him, then, you know, it's important to get him home. So if you notice anything that's not normal around your area, let authorities know, let them go search it out. Let them take that look. But Heather mentioned it earlier. Don't do it yourself because forensic recovery mm -hmm. is a huge thing in search and rescue. Just getting a body out of the water has to be done properly because if there was foul play, if you went and do it, if you go and do it yourself, you can destroy all the evidence. So forensic mm -hmm. recovery is a big, big thing. So if you notice anything, contact law enforcement. Uh, amazing advice. And that's why it's not just a tagline. It is our reality. The best guess in true crime. You just saw why uh, the fastest 90 minutes, maybe in this case, 75 minutes. We went a little bit shorter today in all of true crime. I'll leave you with a fun story. My kids had my middle daughter had an assembly this morning. Um, they said, I said to her, are you sure you want me to go? I was joking. And she said, yes. Yeah. So we all go this morning and uh, there's never a dull moment with the COE. Of course we were late because she was getting ready. We were all ready and, uh, we are running late. So the COE, um, rushes us out of the minivan. I never thought I would say that word, but yes, I have the minivan. I kind of love it actually. And, um, door slides open, kids hop out. We all go into this assembly. We're hanging out to cheer on uh, the middle sister. And uh, the COE comes in and she says, uh, like 20 minutes later, she's all like flustered looking and says, um, the woman said that I took her parking. So I'm like, what woman? She's like, there's a woman out there. She's a little nuts. She said that she was waiting 35 minutes for the parking spot. I didn't give it to her. I got in there. I wouldn't be surprised if our tires are slashed, blah, blah, blah. This is what you call Thursday in the Waldman family. Uh, sure enough, the assembly is over. My daughter did a beautiful job. Get back to the car. The COE gets in, and I'm like, COE, uh, you're notorious for a reason. There's a problem. And as I look down on the handles of the SUV, of the minivan, uh, that woman egged our car. Egged our car, which is why the COE here said – what grown woman? This woman's like 45, 50 years old. I went back and took a photo. Welcome to Miami of the of the car of the lady who egged me. LOL. The good news, my car is officially egg-free. The notorious COE. The kids thought it was funny. I had one thought after this. I was like, what if this was Nate Diaz or Nick Diaz's car? Those are UFC fighters. And you egged their car. She he didn't know. She didn't know who she was dealing with. I could have been Nick Diaz. It would have come out and slapped this woman. So be nice to everybody. Don't egg cars. Don't egg people on. Be nice to kids, uh, mm -hmm. especially if they're uh, on the spectrum with autism. Have a wonderful night. Love you, America. Love you. Are you in Tennessee, Heather? You're I Tennessee. am. Okay. Mm -hmm. Love you, Tennessee. Love you, Ottawa, Canada. And of course, uh, let's please keep Sebastian in our minds. We'll be back at a special time tomorrow probably from the other studio where I feel much more safe without my audio cutting out. And we will be dis discussing uh, Brian Koberger. Send in a tip. 
even, even if you think law enforcement already knows, that's a tip from Matthew McMahon. And we are going to keep Rachel Morin's name out there. Rachel Morin, say her name. Her life was taken way too abruptly uh, back in August. The killer is still out there to lose. We will definitely be doing a follow-up show on that uh, either next week or the week after. Until then, love you, America. Thinking of you, Sebastian. Hope you come home safe. 